Hello everybody, welcome to this week's video. My name is Martin, I am an Inkscape developer developing features and fixes for everyday Inkscape users. Welcome to these videos where I talk about some, some of the work that I've been getting up to this week. Um, before, before we get into the work, I wanna give a big shout out and a big thank you to all of the people that pay me for my time. Uh, it's thanks to people like you who basically fund my work here on Inkscape that I'm able to dedicate time to fixing these issues and adding the kinds of things that you want to see. Um, if you'd like to join them, please consider visiting the links in, in the description to my Patreon and my LibrePay. And uh, yeah, let's get on to the actual work. So this week I wanted to talk about um, an addition to the document pro properties. So document properties allows you to adjust lots of items in the uh, the way the document is scaled and some of the colors and things, things like that. Um, there is, however, a problem. And that's that the option to scale uh, doesn't rescale the actual objects. It just changes the scale of the SVG, which is fine if uh, you don't care about the actual physical sizes of things. But it's very bad if you are trying to export things to an actual like physical cutting machine. Um, and so what I did is I added a feature where you can actually lock the scale. So a little extra button that when pressed resizes all of the objects. Okay, this sounds complicated, so let me give you an example. Say you open an SVG document and it's scaled in centimeters, and you want to actually change the SVG so that it's scaled in inches instead. If you came in here and you changed the scale in Inkscape 1.3, a one centimeter object on the canvas would turn into a one inch object. Uh, maybe that's what you want, but if you now press the new button, that one centimeter object will retain its original size. It'll be one centimeter in physical units, and it'll be set to the whatever uh, the, uh, the appropriate size of a centimeter in an inch is. Um, this should give some flexibility when it comes to scaling documents. Uh, this code was actually not that hard. We already had code that could do this. Basically, when uh, opening old documents, you'll sometimes find a pop-up that comes up and says, oh, uh, you know, you're using 72 dots per inch, but like new SVG files use 96 dots per inch. Um, how would you like it to be rescaled? And one of those options was to maintain the physical sizes of objects. This is basically that, but we're providing it to the average user so that they can take advantage of it. Um, okay, so that's that fix. Next, I wanted to move on to flatten images. This is a, an extra feature that was added in 1.3 thanks to the Shape Builder tool, but there are some issues. Uh, firstly, there's an issue with the fact that if you change the way the Shape Builder tool operates, basically you change the preferences, um, that would change the way the flatten operator works. This is incorrect, right? The, the Shape Builder tool should be isolated from the flatten operator. Um, they're in two different places in, 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 the, in the UI, and even if they're using the same code underneath, that doesn't necessarily mean that the user expects preferences to be shared between the two. Um, also, I greatly improved the ability for Flatten to operate on raster images. So I'm actually going to bring an example of that in. Um, the Shape Builder tool in 1.3 cannot operate on raster images like this photograph. Uh, but in, in 1.4, or the next version of Inkscape, you can actually use shapes and draw shapes on top of your um, raster image and then use the Shape Builder to basically cut the, the, the raster image or the photograph into pieces. Now with uh, the Flatten improve, improvements, you can actually use Flatten to very quickly basically uh, take a photograph that's being covered up by other shapes and then very quickly find out which portion of that is actually visible. Um, this should basically open up a whole bunch of avenues for, you know, working with raster images in a better, more interesting way. Um, it also affects some of the other shape builder tools. It's a general clean cleanup, but it affects that tool the most. Um, also fixed is the way in which the flatten tool operates on strokes. Um, so what was happening before is that if you had a, 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 an object with a large stroke on it, the stroke was basically ignored and you get very inconsistent results. This also means that you would end up with um, broken objects if you had, say for instance, a circle and there was a piece of the circle missing. 
um, this this incomplete object wouldn't uh, even work in the shape of the builder. It wouldn't work in the uh, flatten operator. The shape would just be deleted, in fact, which is the wrong thing to do. So now what we do is uh, we turn all of the shapes into, um, we basically run um, stroke to path. And so if you have a stroke on an object, that stroke gets turned into a path that then gets flattened. Um, I actually ran a poll. Uh, thank you to everybody that responded to that poll about like what you expect it to do. Uh, but this is by far and away the thing that people most expected it to do. They expected flatten to flatten the strokes as well as the fills. So if you have a scenario where you think that you want strokes to be ignored, then remove the strokes first. Um, the other thing that this means is that if you want a gap between your flattened objects, then adding a stroke in is actually a really great way of doing that. You can just add the stroke, flatten it, and then delete those objects of whatever color it is that you've chosen um, to create an effect where you're basically se separating the flattened objects. Maybe that's useful for the, doing things like jigsaw puzzles. I'm not sure. Uh, that's what for you, you, you guys to play, play with. Okay, so talking about preferences, um, there is this thing in Inkscape where, as programmers, we like using preferences as a way of maintaining state. Um, that's a very confusing way of putting that, but what it basically means is, is that when you go into the preferences uh, dialog and you change a bunch of things, that's only one way of changing preferences. There's also other ways of cha changing preferences. Every time you press a toggle in a uh, toolbar every time you use one of the dialogues and it saves bas basically what it was doing before uh, things like default colors and default fonts and stuff all of those are preferences they're the same preferences um, so when a programmer wants to run a piece of code but they don't want the preferences to be used like they have a very specific intent about what they intend to do uh, let's say they created a function called make this thing red the last thing they want is they, they don't want your preferences being used in the fun function where they know what they want. They want it to be red. They don't want it to be your color. Uh, and so what they would do is they would set the preference to red, overwriting your preference, run their function, and then set it back to what uh, you had in there before. The problem with this is that it's very fragile. Um, you can imagine a, a scenario where like the the part of the code that resets it back to the way it was before gets ignored by accident or gets returned and this has happened several times where preferences get mashed because of some function that you run some extension that you did and uh, it just wasn't put back properly so what i've done is i've created a um, what's known as a guard or a scope guard this is a coding machine and it basically allows the pro programmer to uh, undo the preferences back to whatever they were as soon as you're finished with that code and consistently too so that every single time um, a programmer wants to run a fun function by changing some preferences they basically create one of these scope guards change a bunch of preferences and that's all they have to do because the scope guard will put everything back the way that it was before when their scope is finished when their code is finished um, this is just a basically way of improving Inkscape's consistency. Uh, also, as before, we're still writing tests. We're still making sure that this stuff will continue to work. So I resurrected some tests for the preferences. Uh, all of that pre preferences XML stuff is now is now finally being tested properly. I don't even know why that was put into the great graveyard. That just seems silly. Uh, so uh, those are the general improvements that I've been getting up to. I've also been doing color stuff, but as usual, I'm going to put that off until I actually have something to show you. So let's talk about Inkscape. Um, there's no general news about In Inkscape, but I wanted to tell you a story. I did a talk at the um, Creative Freedom Summit. This is a Fedora design team run project where there's tons of people talking about Blender and Critter and Penpart and Inkscape and talking about their designs. If you're interested in that, I'm, I'm going to put a link in the description because I think there are lots of people who would get a kick out of watching all, all of these elite designers talk, talking about their workflows. Um, but what came up was this idea that Inkscape should have the ability to share a document with some somebody else live so that when you edit um, your, your graphic, somebody else can be also editing the same graphic at the same time. And um, 
Yeah, so so let me tell you a story about Pedro. Um, Pedro was in Inkscape in 2008, and Pedro died. Um, Pedro is the name of the whiteboarding fe feature that used to be in Inkscape that basically allowed you to do this functionality. And I wanted to talk about the fact that Inkscape used to have this fun functionality before its time, I would say, and how it died. Um, basically, the way that Pedro would work was um, you would sign up to, you would sign Inkscape up to your chat bot. You would, you, you know, you, well, let me put this in a friendlier way because I want you to understand it. Um, you would sign Inkscape up to a, to your chat room and Inkscape would send fragments of your document through chat, through instant messenger, to another Inkscape that was listening on the other side, right? That's the very bare bones of how it worked. Um, and so you could effectively have multiple Inkscapes all subscribe to this chat room, listening for document fragments, and you'd have more than two people basically working on the same document collectively. Um, it worked, I know, because I tested it back in 2008. So how did it die, and why doesn't Inkscape have this functionality anymore? So the reason is, I think, because it was never considered complete, and so it was never enabled by default. Uh, this has effectively killed the feature, because if there's one thing about Inkscape that I think should be known, it's that user testing is predominant. It's how we make sure things continue to, to work. It's something we're trying to change with more unit te testing and automated te testing, but especially historically. If your feature wasn't enabled by de default, then it was going to bit rot, right? Unless a developer was like really on top of it, there's no way you can keep it live properly. Like the Inkscape codebase is continuously mo moving. It's mutating all of the time. Um, so it was a it was a compile flag. It was an optional extra that you could enable at compile time. So it wasn't even some, something you could download separately and add to your in Inkscape. Um, and there were some releases of Inkscape on certain distributions of Linux that actually contained Pedro enabled by default, uh, but not enough. And eventually the original pro programmers that worked on it moved on. They doing other things. And so the feature... Uh, got worse and worse and worse, and subsequent programmers disabled it bit by bit by bit until eventually in 2009, it was disabled entirely, and then the code was re removed. Um, and it's a shame because, like, I think it could have been a really interesting feature. I think it's also a good guide for what could happen in the future if somebody came along and decided to do a whiteboard fe feature again. Um, I'm imagining, for example, now we would probably integrate with things like Penpot or something like that, where, you know, some other service handles the integration of the online component, and then Inkscape is just a client to that. That would be a nice way to go. So anyway, thank you for listening to my history lesson about the Inkscape pro project. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and I may or may not see you next week. Okay, so... I'm going to Fostem, so I'm flying out uh, midweek, and I will be in London, maybe in London, maybe in Brussels, when I do a video, and we'll see how things work out, and maybe I'll see you next week, maybe I'll see you the week after that, but thank you for watching this one.